The Valley Current. Welcome in to The Valley Current. There you are. There I am. And I'm so delighted to have you join the podcast because I've only been asking you to do this for about the last 10 years. Yes. And you're always too busy because you're always trying these big whale cases. And I keep Not saying, true. You, you can't you can't do this forever, man. You got to make a little bit of time. Don't, to talk. don't oversell the, the product here. <laughs> so, Ed, just for a few minutes, give folks no. a background. Give folks a background of how you came to Silicon Valley because I think it's a rich story. I came to Silicon Valley when I was 10 years old because my father was a double E. And he was working for Western Electric and Bell Labs. In Palo Alto, right? No, no, in, in Sunnyvale. Ba down there where uh, National Semiconductor is. But there was nothing there then. It was all orchards. And, right. Uh, so anyway, so I went to school there and grew up in that environment and went off to uh, Berkeley for college. And um, in the course of my, of the, growing up in the 60s, I had a certain amount of social uh, good sensibility. So I went to law school to save the world. <laughs> little did I know, <laughs> little yeah. I know when I entered law school that all it's about is money. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and even if you want to save the world, all you really do is save the money. Usually the funny story, usually the funny story about law school is it's very frustrating because you think you're going to save the world, but then you take a course like trust in estates, which is all about accumulating money. And in the afternoon, you take another course about antitrust, which is all about breaking up the trusts. <laughs> well, you know, that was one of the things like when I was at, at Hastings, I used to uh, volunteer at the Haight Ashbury Legal Clinic. Okay. And, and basically what that did for me is I learned how to keep anybody, any deadbeat, who was not paying their rent in their apartment for 18 months at least after they saw wow. me. Wow. And, and I used to really enjoy that because I used to tick off the uh, opposing counsel. I have to say it to him, I say, Flout, so look, here's the deal. You can either, you can mess around here and I'll take you, I'll keep this tied up for 18 months at least. You're a law student. Or, You're a law student talking this way. You're a law student yeah. talking this way. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, or alternatively, we can make a deal that my guy likes. What do you want to do? <laughs> and, and the guy's like, do I have to get down on my knees? <laughs> yeah, right. I, 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 you know, I always had knee pads in my, um, in my briefcase. That's pretty uh, funny. Uh, so, so you learned how to litigate as a street fighter. Yeah. You were a street yeah. fighter. Well, I tried to be. Well, so the, what happened was that a guy named, there was a famous uh, local litigator named Fred Firth came to our class and uh, to the school and did a, a uh, presentation about uh, big litigation. He had one of the premier, probably the premier plaintiffs antitrust firm in the country at that time. Right, I remember him. I do and, actually. Do remember him? Yeah, and I, I was, I was completely bowled over. So at the end of my second year, I went over there and to get a summer clerkship with him, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a pretty wild case, but. Uh, Eventually, I got it. Uh, during that period of time, I was in two trials. I, w I was um, as, a summer, as a summer clerk. As a summer clerk, oh, I, I, was two, not, I was in first chair. Mm -hmm. with two trials. <laughs> but I was in two trials. Willie Brown was lead counsel on one of them. I was. I did all the injury instruction, eliminate motions, and I got to argue them, even though nice. I was yet uh, admitted to the bar or graduated from school. So I got. I went up on the learning curve for trial pr preparation. Real fast and real hard. Is that and, how you met? Is that how you met Judge Kelleher and he offered his no, daughter to you? No, how did you meet not, she was a year behind me in law school. That's oh, okay. Because that's but the they, that's the Kelleher of King of Keller King Kelleher is you and your wife, that's right? That's yeah. that's a that's a rare feat to pull off. I have to tell you, that's <laughs> very rare. Hey, I'm a street fighter, man. That's what I do. I do crazy no, my stuff. My parents, my parents were married right up to death, and they used to fight every day of the week. They just didn't get divorced. Yeah. Their attitude was, "We're Catholic. We can't get divorced. But well, we hate know, each other." One of my theories of my ability to do patent cases, because I understand engineers, because my dad, dad was an engineer, and of course, he and my mother didn't have, couldn't exchange two words for their entire marriage because he's an engineer. <laughs> So I understand was, that when you're he, going he into was, court, he you got to get down where people live. 
He was talking in code and your mom was talking in English. To the extent that he talked at all. He talked <laughs> <laughs> but so, we both took, um, what's the, uh, because the app, what's the early soft, the early uh, code? Fortran. 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 We Fortran. both took Fortran together, my father and oh, I. Wow. I was, I was in eighth grade and he was in wherever he was in. Wow. So he um, bought you, probably bought you a little personal computer when they first came out, right? He did not. He Personal didn't. computers came out when I was in college. We, we didn't do anything. Small, small world there, though. One of my friends at, at Berkeley was uh, Wozniak's sister. Oh, okay. Leslie. And uh, she had a lot of snide things to say about that whole operation. But that's not here and there for today. Well, you know, you know that Jobs and Wozniak came in to what was then Davis, Stafford, Kelman, and Fenwick to start the company up because they were operating in a general partnership with a third guy that they wanted to get rid of, which they did get rid of. This is all public information. I'm yeah. not revealing any secrets here. And like idiots, we didn't take the 5% they were willing to give right. us legal fees. That's another story for another time. But so Ed, you went to law school, you did well, uh, you clerked, in, I think you then clerked for a federal judge, didn't you? I clerked for, uh, actually, I went to work for first at the birth firm. Okay. And it took me about, a year to 18 months to figure out that I didn't really want to carry people's bags. Okay. So I figured out what to, I couldn't figure out what to do. And I found out I clerked at the ninth circuit court of appeals for judge chambers. Okay. Because his clerk quit in the middle of a, a deal. middle of okay. the year. And then he um, liked me quite well and set me up with a clerkship with judge Tom Murphy of the Southern district of New York. Oh, nice. And, and Murphy was a great, tremendous, both those guys were great men to, to work with. That's and, a great mentorship. It, you have a one-two punch mentorship that no yeah, one. Well, you know, like. Murphy was Murphy was the prosecutor of Alger Hiss. Right, right. Yeah. I know that. And so it was, I know you know, that. We and with Murphy, I went to I went to we went to lunch every day. Wow, nice. so that was fun, and That's and lunches uh, educational. So then after that, I came out and I was trying to figure out what to do, and I got a job with a couple of partner a couple of partner level people that um, one was the general litigation counsel for Northrop and the other one was general counsel for Martin Marietta. Okay. So this looked like a pretty good opportunity. Right. I was the, I was our first associate in San Francisco. My, my deal was um, I was, you know, there were a small firm. I was a little scared about small firms because I had been a small firm previously. And um, I said, so I'll, make, I'll do the deal, but I have to be the highest paid associate in San Francisco. Okay. So I made three grand more than everybody else. Really? That a was year? Fun. Three grand more a year? Yeah. What, what did you start at? Like 20,000? No, 48. 48,000? That yeah. high? Yeah. As a first year associate? Well, no, because I had the clerkships. Oh, okay. So you were like a third year associate. Yeah. Maybe but, fourth year. I mean, I was, who knows? I mean, that's hard to say. I mean, when I started at Davis Stafford, it was 22,000 a year. I put in 3,000 hours and tried four cases in my first year. And they were like, yeah, we'll give you maybe like a $2,000 bonus. Yeah. It was insulting. It was insulting. Yeah, it, was, it was like it was like med school. This, the young people were just there to be exploited. Right. But I was already been exploited. So I, I, I recognize exploitation. <laughs> and so I, I said, this is what it's going to be. And it took me about three months to realize I wasn't going to work out there. Then it was okay. just a matter of out too. But we had I was involved in some very, very high profile cases. Right. Uh, the two big cases, one was an antitrust case that had to do with the um teaming agreements for the stealth bomber. And okay. I had to get a special clearance to be able to do anything and all that kind of stuff. Right. And the other big case I had to do was representing Synanon. If you remember uh Synanon uh, suing everybody in the world and um for defamation. And wow. I got involved with that. Those are my two the two things I did. They were really great experiences to, to be there. But um there was still the problem of that, you know, I was too far down the totem pole. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was given a lot of a lot of uh responsibility and not not nearly enough authority. This is nineteen eighty time frame, right? Nineteen eighty? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I quit the job there. And in 1983, in April of 83, I started my own firm. You just had your 40th year anniversary then. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you're a math major. That's pretty amazing. 40th year anniversary, that's pretty amazing to me. So anyway, um, I started my own firm. 
I had a I had a contingency fee case, which was a, a pretty big, high profile case in the San in San Francisco. Um, we settled the case. I thought I was rich because I got all this money in this settlement, and I right. and I had no business. I had I had I had money in the bank account and no business. And so, interesting kind of thing here. I um, invented a sort of in, invented representing. Uh, sports people against their agents for stealing their money. Okay. No one was doing that. All the guys in sports were Mickey Mouse guys that wanted to wear gold chains and ride in limousines. I was, was a real boy. And snort and snort coke. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but, but I mean, it was it was shooting fish in a barrel because I was I was a, a real lawyer. So it took. So what happens is I start my own firm. I get this money. I got nothing to do, and I'm freaking out because I'm going. I'm going to run out of money eventually. So it was a great, I got a great piece of advice. Talked to this fellow, tried to recruit me for his little little firm, and I didn't want to do what he was doing. But I was thinking I might have to take the job because I had to have some money. Right. And he said, I said, I'm trying to decide whether to just go out my own and go for it or not. And he said, well, here's the deal, Ed. If you go out on your own and you fail, what do you do? You go get a job. You've got a good resume. You're going to get a job in a heartbeat. So why, if that's what you really want to do, why are you going to screw around with me? And uh, that's what happened. And uh, about six months after I ran out of business, I been working with a tax attorney that I'd known for quite a long time. And he came up with a tax shelter. Some uh, San Francisco Giants baseball players were involved in some tax shelter scams. And they were getting disallowed to have all this back, back taxes owed. Right. I got the case. That case made the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Wow, nice. In 1985, I think the case made the front of the Wall Street Journal. That pretty much gets you business. You know, oh, front yeah, page there Wall you Street go. Journal. You got to put an ad in the Wall Street Journal. That'll do it, right? I, you know, it's better if, the, if they put the ad in. They, they put the ad in. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, so I, then. By the way, so just stop here for a second. Do you have a scrapbook for the 40 years that you put in as a San no, Francisco? I have, occasional, I have occasional scrap, but I don't have a scrapbook. <laughs> Uh, I have a scrapbook, or I had a scrapbook that literally was from the June 1985 start, because I was at Fen Davis Stafford, and then it right. became Fenwick, blah, 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 Fenwick and West. And I had to put in a lot more time transitioning. It's a separate story, transitioning the stuff that I was working on, because I was managing like six or eight associates. And I had a scrapbook that I started in 1985, and I and I had it right up to like last year, a couple of years ago, and I can't find it, and I'm really annoyed about it. It's it, it's got to be somewhere. It's I can like, relate to your tape. Thick. It was like this. I, was, thick. I had a tape of my first my first TV appearance with Lee Steinberg and Harry Edwards. Nice. And uh, who was the guy here in town? Uh, I don't know one of the sportscaster guys. And I, I had the tape of it, and it was great. Oh man, you need that. You're very it's gone. Photogenic, I can't. I can't find it. You're very photogenic, Ed. For, uh, for you know, that's uh, I've been told that my whole life. For anyway. for a guy that's fifty nine uh, years old, you're very photogenic. <laughs> for how much? Fifty nine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so within so, the order of magnitude. I'm just curious. When is your birthday? Given that the start of the firm was uh, your start of your firm was April of of 1983. What 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 month is your birthday? Huh? 1952. What 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 month? Uh, January. January twenty third. January twenty third. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So, at any rate, being an enterprising kind of guy, one of the things I did immediately after I got the the Wall Street Journal article, right? I, I started looking at. Um, and because I was involved in sports, it was about being involved in sports. I looked around at all the CLEs and conventions and sports sports lawyers conventions. And I called them all and said, hey, I'm the God. You want me to come there and speak? Had you, had you gone to UCLA in the last year that I was at UCLA, they had a, a guy who taught an advanced elective class in sports law and sports uh, representation. Yeah. He's a big chubby guy that used to play football that became a lawyer. His last name is Slaughter. He might still be around. He was like a famous football player, and he basically retired from football, no brain injuries to know. To at least he didn't yeah. reveal any. 
And he knew the ins and outs of sure. everything to do with representation of especially football players, but he expanded it to everything, you know, baseball. Well, he couldn't be that big because I never sued him. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he was teaching at UCLA and yeah, I was just saying. A discipline yeah. called sports law. And it was emerging. It was an emerging discipline yeah. back then. So I sent all stuff out and basically I would get these speaking engagements and a speaking engagement was worth about a quarter million dollars to me. Oh, wow. Because everywhere, everywhere I went, I would get within three months, I'd get a case out of it. Well, that's beautiful. Wow. So that's I was, really I was, beautiful. I was smoking. I mean, I was like 35 years old and I was up to six were, lawyers working for me and all this were you stuff. Were you married at that point? Had you formed King and Kelleher? Um, I got married at 35. So yeah. it's a long ways away still. So you were a wealthy guy at the time you got married. That's interesting. Well, I wasn't wealthy. I wasn't wealthy enough. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask. I was making money. A, I won't ask if you had a prenup. I'll leave that uh, off. Yeah, right. Tape. <laughs> so but I got to do some crazy. I got to do some really fun stuff. Um, okay. uh, flying all over the country. I was I was featured in a BBC thing on the uh, Business of Sports in America. Okay. And I was. Um, I was one, there were five people featured. I was one of them, and I was the commentator through the whole thing. Okay, so it was filmed down at SC, and it was a lot, that was fun. <laughs> so I used to part of my my speech. I say, look, here's how it works. If I call, you better answer your phone. <laughs> yeah, that's just how it works. Okay, and and you know most of the people at these at the you know all these people go to these these all these conventions and meetings kind of got a network. Right, no one's networking with the people that are attending. The network is the guys who are talking. Right. You know? Right. So I became I became special counsel of the NBA Players Association. I was special counsel of NCAA and special counsel of NFLPA. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm nice. running around with all kinds of you know rich celebrity people. Um, and it was pretty boring after the first week, but it was it was good work. But like one of the things I did, I one of my favorite stories was a guy named Bruce Allen. His father was George Allen. Was a Coach of the Washington, whatever Indians, Redskins, were. Redskins. They had to change their Redskins. name. Though. Yeah. So anyway, so Bruce Allen became, became an agent because of his father's uh, connections, right? And he was, and he was um, just ripping my guy. He was ripping a lot of guys. Right. He was in with Tarkanian, and they were doing all this stuff. Right. And, and what they do is they put they put people in these investments, and they put the coaches in investments. They put the uh, the players in investments. The right. players all lost money. The coaches all made money. Right. And the reason why the coaches made money is because they took the money from the players' investments and handed it to the And that's how they bought Classic, classic how Pon Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I called them up and I said, look at, give my guy a couple hundred thousand bucks or I'm going to put you out of business. And and you learned that tactic when you were doing landlord-tenant law. Exactly. You're, there you go. And, the, and his lawyer just didn't really believe that. He goes, well, who are you? Who are you, you, know, who are you Mr. King? Yeah. And I said, well, why don't you do your homework and then call me back next week? And I'm telling you right now, you don't want to mess around. You just want to give my guys money and we'll go home. So I gave him a deadline. Hmm. I said, if you don't do this, I'm going to crucify you. So he didn't give us the money on Wednesday, on Thursday morning. I had arranged for the, for with the uh, FBI and the uh, local new, the Phoenix newspaper had a, a banner headline: "FBI raids Allen." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and That's that put good. him out. That put him out of the uh, agent business. And I used to then I, that became one of my uh, closing arguments when it, when you know with new clients. Nice. <laughs> Nice. See, see, you could work easily for another law firm just being their their lead generator. Like you I could do a lot feed. of stuff. But you, you know feed. what? Why you would I want to work for another law firm? I know that's bad. You'd have to work with other lawyers. I do tell you that. You know, there's a firm. There used to be a big firm called Thielen Marin. Yeah, you know that firm. Yeah, they I do. put a big rush on me to come over there and do a patent litigation practice for them. Nice, nice. And so they had me as lunch. And there's like 15 guys from the IP department there. And um, you got so bored, you couldn't even imagine. Oh, being it's better than room. that. So we started <laughs> talking about, you know, well, how do you think you could fit in here? I said, well, it's not a problem like fitting in here. I'll tell you exactly how I fit in here. I hire who I want. I pay him what I want. And um, 
I get rid of all you guys. Because you guys can't, you know, clearly they go, we have a committee for that. I go, no, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> we're, I said, we, we're not looking for just, you know, library jocks. We want guys that can make something happen. Yeah. yeah. And they go, well, I don't know. And I said, well, I don't know either. And I said, <laughs> I, I I said, I said but the other thing is, you know, I always, you know, everybody will tell you they'll do whatever you want to do. And they'll say, we'll give you all this money, give you all this resources, give us all this opportunity. But you really don't know have much way of enforcing that. So I said, so the only way really that I can feel good about this is if we change the name of the firm to King and Thielen. Ah! <laughs> that was the end of the luncheon. <laughs> <laughs> well, they went out of business, so you made the right choice, right? Yeah, well, that was fun. So then what happened, what really turned things around, I was doing securities law up the wazoo in the okay. 80s. And I was getting tired of it, getting bored of the celebrity practice. Okay. Uh, and because you know, what happened, everyone, none of the celebrities are educated. Mm. You know, most of them can barely speak English. I mean, it's just, <laughs> I mean, that, was, that was just really wasn't what I was signing up one to do. And um, if, you, if you're going to, if you're going to barely speak English, you had to be poor. That was my deal. Okay. And, um, so I got bored because all that happened is that with all the athletes that I get calls from the wives, there's no money in the bank. And then I show me, show me the money, country. show me the money. Yeah. And I had some great things. I had a guy that, I mean, I had a fellow that he had disabled children, really severely disabled children, cost him a lot of money and he lost a bunch of money and he actually took a second mortgage out on his house Yeah, to build yeah. me to go after the money for him. Wow. And that was, that was, that was a little pressure for me. And mm -hmm. I like that. I, mean, I like pressure. That's what I like. I thrive on it. But that was an interesting case. Um, but anyway, I was getting tired of it. And what happened is that some of my buddies from the old antitrust days, um, you know, antitrust, as we all know, antitrust and patents are sort of um, counterclaim situations. Right. I've been involved right. peripherally in a, in a counterclaim situation when I when I first started. Right. And these guys from Washington, D.C. said, listen, why don't you, um, we have this case in the Eastern District of, of uh, New York which is a CCD chips case and all the discoveries back out in Silicon Valley. Why mm -hmm. don't you become our local counsel for discovery? Mm. Okay. And so that's what I did. And I, um, I went, did what I always do. I went wild with it and, uh, had some very good results. And then they referred me to an, uh, a, a firm, uh, some guys that didn't know what they were doing had mm. a great case and didn't know what they were doing. And they said, the, the, my connections in Washington said, you got these guys ought to talk to you. They're going to call you. So I call mm -hmm. them. So I get these guys. This is unbelievable. I get these guys and they had a deck relief action filed against them because they had stupidly written these letters in a way that allowed it. Yeah. They weren't ready for it. Right. And they were offering to, to, to settle their claim for a hundred thousand dollars. Well, we will pay you the defendant a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> To let us get out of this this thing. Well, I got in there and I started looking around, mm -hmm. and I said to them mm -hmm. that uh, you guys are you guys are messed up. You got a good case here. Don't do this. And that and that eventually became eight figures. And basically, I provide backbone, and that got me into the more much more patent stuff. And then the the uh, dot com debacle in the late nineteen nineties two thousand with that range right. It was an interesting thing. I was flying an uh, airplane. I'm sitting next to this guy, and we're talking about it all. And he says, well, you know what I'm doing? I'm going to all these little R&D companies, and I'm buying up their equipment. Okay. Because they're, they're desperate for money, and I'm reselling it. He says, I'm killing I'm kicking, I'm killing it. I'm making a ton of money. And I said, huh, what are you doing with their patents? Right. And he said, what's a patent? You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. He, he had nothing to do with it. So I, um, so at that time I started, I decided to start mm -hmm. hustling to try and get some, uh, yeah. yeah, what I call yeoman inventors, guys that, mm -hmm. that invented stuff in their backyard or a little, little home lab or whatever. And, um, we did pretty well with that. And then I got a few big cases, you know, giant cases from the guys in Washington. I got Bob's cup from represent Loral space and communications for 15 years. Mm. And so that 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 covered the overhead pretty well. Percentage wise, 
gigantically, you know, successful. Right. They're, small, they're smaller companies, so they don't have, you know, they're not, they're going to have giant, um, giant damages necessarily. But, you know, if you're getting, if you're getting damages that are, in my view anyway, damages that are eight or nine times the value of the company, hmm. that's a pretty good result. You were lucky enough to have great success at the front end because a lot of lawyers are not so lucky when they start their own practice, right? Well, I mean, uh, all lawyers I know that start their own practice did real well. <laughs> you, know, you don't see the other guys. Um, what I was going to say is that um, you know a lot of that is being willing to work and deal, take the risk. I mean, other people that, that I with whom I've spoken about this that are seasoned say, well, the deal is you got you know, no one wants to take the risks that you're willing to take. And you know, like I tell people, like, you know, I might not get a new case for three years. You know, and but one of the things I was going to say that was really also made things very successful, pretty successful, was that with these yeoman uh, inventors, these little guys, it's a, it's a career. You know, I mean, the first, the first case, um, the first really great case I had of that was we had 25 lawsuits. We sued everybody in the world. When I was representing Loral, the CCD chips case, I was just, it was unending mm. amounts of work. Um, so one of the things that, you know, you don't have to have in this, in, if you're in the patent area, you see in this, when I was doing the security stuff, one of the things I didn't like about it, it was sort of a volume business. You know, you, you, each case was worth a quarter million dollars in fees and that's all it was worth. Mm -hmm. And when it went away, it went away. In the patent cases, you know, the first case may or may not be, you know, whatever it is. Well, I'm on contingency, so you don't really know. Mm -hmm. But if you have any kind of success in the first case, there, there are 20 dominoes. Right. The dominoes will, will fall rapidly behind the lead case. Right? Au contraire. No? No. 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 Uh, both case, both, the, the two biggest cases like that where we had all these guys – one was um, a hard disk case. Mm -hmm. We sued 25 companies. The 25th company licensed up without us suing them. The wow. first 24, we had to sue them and we had to go screw around with them. Right. The other case, the other case, the jewelry case, I had a case about how to make jewelry thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And in that case, we sued about 20 guys, maybe more. I don't know. I can't remember exactly. And none of them, none of them took a license until we sued them. Wow. And we was going to say, look at guys, what are you doing? Everybody else is licensed up. We survived, you know, four, you know, Markman hearings. Right. We, we know how to do this now. We're going to sue you in San Jose. You know, the judges there love us. Mm. What are you doing? You right. Know? Uh, that was before you had the venue change problem. Right. And then, I, and then after a while of that, I got tired of all that stuff a little bit, and I slowed down and got a little more where I am today, where I work a little less. I don't have one of the things that drove me crazy was having a lot of employees. Yeah, uh, um, I don't want a lot of employees. I mean, I really don't want a lot of employees because well, you've, you've got a team that's sufficient to take the case to trial. And the case yeah. you want are really big cases, right? So oh, you know, all you need, look at in a patent case. Now, see, when you do an antitrust case, you have a big antitrust case, you need an army of people. Right. And you have to go to warehouses and go through all the documents. So you got all the shit to do. In right. a patent case, you don't need an army of people. The only place where you need more, maybe a lot of people maybe, is if the damages is a problem. I mean, if, if, if determining the damages, you know, but the damage theory isn't. But otherwise, you need two smart guys. That's mm -hmm. all. You, that's all you need. I mean, I went in a case in uh, Eastern District of Texas. I got there. I got my guy with his cowboy boots and me, one associate, and an expert witness nice. for a, a Markman hearing. Mm -hmm. And the other side had twelve lawyers. Wow! And we humiliated them. We mm -hmm. absolutely humiliated them. That was so funny. Big firm out of Boston. I can't think of the name of it right now. Oh, in New York. Excuse me. They cited in their Markman documents, they cited Wikipedia as an authority. Wow. I mean, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, to me, it just seems like it's, it's not that hard if you if hmm. you're if you're have a modicum of intelligence, 
and you're conscientious and work hard, you're going to be successful. And if you're not successful, then you got to take a hard look at what it is you're not doing. Right. And I would say by, by successful, I mean, I'm getting rich. I mean, you know, but I mean, you should be able to live pretty damn well. Um, but uh, I had some terrible experiences with employees, you know, alcoholics coming to this work drunk. Ouch. Stuff like that. Uh, well, so, that's, a, that's, a, that's a little known secret within California and New York and other state bars is about 25% of the lawyers hang out in bars and well, get probably more than 25%. It's yeah, a big number. It's a highly had, stressful job. So people use self medication in lots of different. I had a, a woman lawyer, clerked at the in the, in the Northern District of California. All great resume. She lasted a week because she was a drunk. I mean, she was just she couldn't control oh. herself. And I had no, you know, yeah. You one of the things you have to do if you're in a smaller firm like that, you have to, you can't have any. Patience. You've got to right. cut your right. losses while you can, or else they're mm -hmm. going to eat you up. So now I'm, I got myself. I have a guy who's worked with me for about I don't know thirty years. Wow. He now works on a contract basis rather than employment basis, so that he can not feel as burdened by all my demands. <laughs> he, gets <to laughs> no. he gets to say no now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going <laughs> fishing. He has, he has to say no until I like you know guilt him into doing it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you I bet you're good at that. So let me ask a different question, which is: sure, ask me anything. Do you see Do you see the Silicon Valley scene changing from what you remember of it back, say before the America and Ben Sack, for example, 2010? Okay, here's what I think. Um, I think it is changing because there are a lot more very mature tech companies. Right. And a, a mature tech company is different than a startup or an R&D company. Right. It's a different and it's a completely different uh, culture. Right. You know, just the same way that the that, you know, big giant Latham Watkins is like a different culture than King and Kelleher. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things is I do think you're going to see that you'll see the tech stuff spread out. Now, as far as the as far as the um, startup stuff, that's a different story. Um. You know, I had a case, one of my cases, I had to go to Kista, Sweden, the Silicon Valley of Sweden. And, and Kista, Sweden, Silicon Valley area is about two square blocks about. And the Swedes are very proud of this. I mean, they, you know, and there's a, there's these maps you can get that tell, that you can get and say, it'll show you the startup and the technology uh, density in different areas. Right. Take a look at the map. There's nothing like this. Okay. Okay. I mean, you know, there's a reason why it costs horrendous amounts of money to live in very terrible tracked housing. <laughs> you know, three thousand I mean, dollars a square foot for a cottage in downtown Palo Alto. It's a thousand. Oh, square I'm feet. Talking, no, no, I mean, you're talking. Palo, I'm talking. You know, twenty miles from from Palo Alto in Newark. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm talking. I mean, but the reason the reason why those houses that are, that are going for those houses are going for one point five to two million dollars now over there. Right. In Newark. It's a nice place for lots of people. It's not my taste. Right. But anyway, the reason why because everybody wants to come here. This is where the action is. Right. And and no matter what the Republicans say about oh it's such a terrible place California oh it's so awful it's so awful you know the crime's out of control and there's you know all that stuff. The fact of the matter is the fifth largest economy in the world. Right. It's got we pay we we are are overhead costs are more and our pay is away. It is hugely more. You know what I mean? I mean, we get, we got $20 to you get $20 an hour to flip burgers at McDonald's. Now you don't get that in Arkansas. What, what I don't like, Ed, what I don't like in particular is I remember years ago when you could drive to San Francisco, park on the street and not have your car broken into the last uh, time I drove up to San Francisco, my car, which is a very nice Tesla, the rear window was broken into so they could steal some clothes out of the back seat. Not that these clothes are worth a lot of money. And I was admonished by my brilliant Stanford PhD wife. Most people don't drive to San Francisco anymore and they certainly don't park on the street and they certainly don't park on the street with a brand new Tesla. You're an idiot. Well, I said, thank well, you for reminding me. First of all, you had a Tesla. So that, that's a problem. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, though, that that's transitory. That's that, that's a blip. The 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 um, 
the street is, crime, which is property crime, streets, is down 50% from the year ago. Is it? Is yeah. it really down? Is, is that something is that, that happens? This happens because we're having a mayoral race. I'm mm -hmm. seeing all the stats right now. And uh, <laughs> you have uh, a mayoral race like every year. Well, you know, what can you do? It gets you, it gets you some, it keeps the, it keeps them working on the crime problem. So what did they uh, do? They locked a bunch of people up or they moved them to some shelters? Oh, one of the things is a lot more presence. They put okay. a lot more cops on the streets. And okay. then one of the problems is it's, it's an interesting problem. It's a, it's a tough conundrum. They can't pay enough for the people who live here. Yeah, so that's, that's a problem. That's a problem. And yeah. So, and so they're having a hard time. Oakland's got the same problem too. They can't, Oakland's like at 60% of their, of their population for cops. Yeah. And, and so if you don't have the cops, if you have more, if you have more cops, you get them out there, they're visible, then you don't have as many problems. Um, we also had some vigilantism. But you, you walk daily, as I recall, you walk daily from your office to your home yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. I just have to ask this question. Have you ever been mugged or ever been held up? Because I have multiple friends that do walks in San Francisco. I say, yeah, the problem is I got mugged. I lost my cell phone. I, I would I, say I, about 40 years ago, Yeah, I was walking to the Superior Courthouse, which is yeah. far away from where we are. Yeah. And uh, a homeless guy came up to me and asked me for a quarter. That's it? And I said, I'm not giving you a quarter. Go away. Leave me alone. And he says, don't be, you know, don't be like that. Just give me a quarter. And I said, no, I'm not going to give you a quarter. And he reached into his bib overalls and pulled out, started pulling out something that was metal and says, I'm not going to shoot you. I'm going to cut you. Really? So I a quarter. I gave him a quarter and he went away. And that. That's scared. called extortion. And he's you, clearly you, crazy. That was yeah. extortion. Yeah. I mean, extortion. I mean, the, thing, the thing is, like, I have never been really concerned about crime. I'm not, I don't perceive myself. I mean, I'm getting old, but in the old days, mm -hmm. I didn't perceive myself as a, as a likely victim. You're tall and you're a big guy like me, but I'm just curious. If you had the ability to have concealed carry on you when that happened 40 years ago, would you have pulled a gun on that guy and said, you know what? This bullet is going to go a lot faster than that knife. Although there are people that think people with knives can actually get to you a lot faster than a Well, a couple carry. things. I don't think I would have had a concealed carry in those circumstances. I was going to court. Yeah. Uh, number two is that my understanding is that uh, most of the concealed carry people pull their gun and then they can't uh, shoot. They, they, they don't have the... Uh, they freeze. Yeah, they freeze. They don't, they don't shoot anybody. So I wouldn't see that. Um, I will say that I do... I do discuss getting guns, but not for the street crime, for the Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> what can I tell you? You know, when when the when the Proud Boys come knocking on my door, I, I don't want to be I want to be prepared for them. You need to change the name of the firm to add another K partner, so you could say I work for the KKK, which yeah. is a big law firm in town. And then, then I get a bunch of business. Fine. I get a bunch of business from the Republicans that way. <laughs> you would. You would. So let me just change the topic once again, which is sure. when you when you think about what's happening in the litigation circles of the world where now judges, including mostly federal judges, are setting time limits. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Or what, what's your view on that? Well, I think time limits, I, I, I think time limits, limits, you know, reasonably arrived at time limits are, are a good thing. Good thing, right? I, yeah. My very first patent case, I had time limits with a, with a chess clock. Right. Right. Uh, most people see, see one of the, the beauties of the time limits, and the beauties with the local rules is that it gets you organized and it puts you so you have to do stuff. Right. And and, and one of the reasons why a lot of people are not very good at any of this stuff is that they're disorganized. They don't know where they're going. Right. So right. all that stuff. I mean, I've always thought, I mean, they always say, oh, like in the Northern District now, it's, I think it's expected to be 11 or 12 months to Markman. I say Markman should be in 90 days. Right. You know, right. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, earlier the better. Happen if, if, you know, the, someone's going to win the Markman. Right. And, and I've always said, if I get, if I win, that means I made the rules. If I make the rules, I'm going to win the game. Right. So just so, for the benefit of the audience, a Markman hearing is where the key patent terms that are subject to some interpretive dispute are going to be actually judicially passed upon to give definitions to terms that maybe may not be exactly well defined in the document itself. It's kind of like parole evidence is not allowed. There's an interpretation issue. Sometimes 
extrinsic evidence. Let me, wait, wait, wait. Let, in English, what that means is that the patents have, have words. And let's say the word is blue. They say right. this has to be a blue thing. Mm-hmm. And then there's a dispute. Somebody says, well, blue's got to be, you know, X, Y, Z wavelengths of light from second. And that mm-hmm. one says, no, nah, blue is anything from the range from, from turquoise to, to indigo. Right. And so then the judge decides what it means. And so if I'm if I'm sitting there going, I need the first if I'm arguing for it to be a wavelength of light of whatever blue is, I don't know what it is. Right. Right. Um, and I win that. I'm winning that because I know that makes my case. Right. And that's why. Right. And there's a in fact, there's a case out of the central district footnote. So the judge says every patent case should settle after Markman because clearly someone's going to win and clearly the other guys aren't. <laughs> and, and you're you're saying, I think, what some people have argued, which is the Markman itself maybe sh- should be subject to some interlocutory appeal if there's an issue about, well, is there a mistake that's been made as a matter of law on the Markman, right? Well, the thing about that is, is like, you got to look at, I mean, that's really about judicial efficiency. That's not about ultimate justice. Mm-hmm. But let's say that there's a, uh, if I'm a judge, I go, well, the Markman might be wrong. We'll try the case. And if the guy who thinks it's wrong wins the case anyway in front of the jury, no harm, no foul. Right, right. So why go tie this up and have this thing strung out for an extra two or three years? Um, I mean, I'm also, but this is all sort of plaintiff stuff. I I believe justice delayed is justice denied. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that IPR is just a Republican plot to slow down plaintiffs. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things just, yeah, the, the fact that these guys take forever to have a Markman hearing, there's just no excuse for it. There's absolutely no excuse. Because it's not that, first of all, it's not that much to, in a Markman hearing, especially now when they're saying, well, pick four terms instead of 20, and that's right. all you get. Right. So you got limitations on how much there is there. And, you know, how it just doesn't take that long to prepare for that many guys, for that many terms. And if the if the Markman has a chance to be dispositive, which it should ninety percent of the time, then the judicial judicial efficiency is served. And if you're the plaintiff's guy, you're used to winning, then you're served. Right. That's why I so, like. So, so you mostly do plaintiff's cases. Will you do a defense case on, in oh, a yeah. patent case? You'll do it. Yeah. You'll do a defense case. Uh, I do a defense case a little differently than most defense lawyers. No, seriously, because I think there are a lot of defendants that think if you're a plaintiff's lawyer, you're forever a plaintiff's lawyer. You're not going to be a defense lawyer. Well, I think it's interesting. I think that there's a different culture to plaintiff's lawyers than right. defense lawyers. If you're a, a plaintiff and you go to some big defense firm, you're going to char- you're going to get charged five times as much as your work is worth. Right. And it may not be that good. I mean, it's hard to say. It depends who it is. You know, it's hard to say. But it's gonna be. But the whole culture of the of a big firm, big defense firm, is let's spend as much money as possible because we have a we have a pyramid and the guy on top gets a piece of everybody below him. So let's get lots of people below us working on the case. Right. Um, I think that as a a plaintiff's generally plaintiff's culture being applied to a defense circumstance uh, works pretty well. Okay. Uh, and because. You know what? What a defense? What a defense? The defense culture is. Well, we've got to make sure that we button down everything that could possibly happen. And and the plaintiff's culture is: I'm going to find a juggler, I'm going to grab a juggler, I'm going to rip it out, and I'm going to stomp on it. Right. And so, so I don't have to worry about the hamstring or the mm-hmm. lungs or whatever. I got the juggler. That's all I need. Let's get it. Let's, let's take care of it. Well, that works on the defense side too. I, I had a I had a very untoward experience where uh, there was an insurance company involved, they wanted me to do, they said, here's what you want you to do. And they gave me a whole to-do list of how to approach this case. I said, I'm not doing that. I said, I'm going to take this guy's deposition and, you know, maybe that'll take care of the whole thing. Right. In fact, that guy, the one deposition took care of the whole thing. Nice. You know, but that's not what they do. I mean, like, it's like when, when people come to me and they say, well, can we, you think we can settle this case right away? I said, this is patent cases now. I said, no, the defense firms aren't even going to, aren't even going to, don't even know what the word settlement means until they build at least a million dollars. I mean, that's just, that's just how it goes. You know, I mean, <laughs> and I believe that, that that's what they do. So, so Ed, when you do take a defense case, yeah. how do you, 
how do you budget for some upside? Because you like to have some yeah, upside on a, that's, on that's, a success that's one fee, right? that's, that's why I'll do very many of them. Okay. Um, I, they're just hourly. Um, but you got to budget, right? You particularly for insurance companies. If there's insurance, no, I barely, I almost never get involved with insurance companies. There's not. Okay. I haven't had any insurance companies on patent cases. I've had. You've never, you never had that. No. Okay. There's, but there's you, no insurance. There's no. There's no patent infringement insurance. Okay, so so let's pretend you have a patent case where it seems like the plaintiff is trying to ring the bell and win a hundred million dollars or more. Yeah. And the company comes to you that's been sued. It's a company. It's been sued and it says, we need a budget. Yep. We don't want to spend more than blank, whatever blank is. What do you well, do? That's that? Wait, 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 wait. Whatever blank is, is an important thing. Okay. You know? Well, so here's what, here's what I, what I would tell them. I would say, I would say, I would say this. I say, look at, if you went to a regular normal firm for this thing, um, AILPA statistics would show you that the Northern district, this case is going to be at least $5 million in fees and expenses. That's out of date. It's really going to be eight million dollars. Okay. They must choke, but they must choke right there, right? Most, most they, have any, they have any choice. They got to do it. They got to defend. If the guy wants, to, if the guy who says, "I'll sell for a hundred million dollars," they've got to defend it. That's how it is. So they're stuck. And I say, but the good news for you is that I probably will come in at about sixty percent of that number. Really? Historically, that's what I've done. And the okay. reason why, because I know what I'm trying to do. Yeah. See, I'm not. See, see, what you go to a, a big firm like that. We have they have a smart guy on top. And says, "Well, this, this looks like a case we can work on," and then he he gives out assignments to, to incompetent, unseasoned people who know what they're doing, who have to spend six times as much time to find out right. what's going on. But right. it all gets billed. It all gets billed. Okay. And so all the incentives are to to have as much redundancy as possible. You know, uh, Joe Aliota is the best trial lawyer I've ever seen. I don't know if you know who he is, but he was mm. there. And he's just unbelievable. Alioto. Alioto yeah. and Alioto, right? Yeah. Mm. Well, not anymore because he's died. Mm. But yeah, but he was absolutely the best I'd ever seen. Mm. And his rule was that if you have more than three pieces of paper in your case and you're playing, if you're going to lose. Mm. And I feel the same way about lawyers because when you, the more lawyers you have, the information gets dispersed and you, no one has comprehensive information. Right. And so if you're on the plaintiff side or the defense side, you want as small and tight knit a piece of group as you can get. Right. But the big firm incentives are for the, the, the opposite smart guy to have 8,000 cases mm -hmm. with 40,000 associates running around and he never knows anything that's going on. <laughs> and so, so that's, you know, so, so I, what I bring to the, I bring a little different take on it uh, to the party. So you think if a budget by say a big law defense firm is eight million, with whatever number of people, probably at least three x to five x the number of people that you would put on a case, right. which would just be you and maybe a couple of associates. Yeah, you think you'll come in at at sixty percent of that budget? I come at five million. If they got eight million, I come at five. Okay, so that's what I would, no, you, you know that's not. That's not an absolute rule, but that's what right. I would expect. But uh, it's not because what you're saying, it's not because your hourly rate is that different. It's because the hours you actually bill will be fewer, right? right. Because they're much more efficient than they want to go. Because your rate, your hourly rate is probably similar, which is close to $1,000 an hour. Yeah. Or, I, mean, it's, it, I mean, I think rates are high. Uh, but yeah, I, think, I think rates are embarrassing. They're embarrassing, right? Embarrassing. I have one case at 1000 an hour. And I'm not very comfortable with it. I was talking to a big firm buddy of mine, partner at a big firm. He said, well, if you were here, we'd be charging you 1600 an hour. And I was going, that can't possibly I, I get those pitches all the time from big firms that say, why don't you come over? We can probably up your hourly rate by like more than 50%. Yeah. Like, you know, it should take away a lot of freedom, right? I mean, right. well, that's the problem. I mean, not like that, but it's psychological. I mean, you know, one of my, one of my little mantras is, I'm not here. I tell the people, I said, look, I'm not here to make your problems worse. I'm here to fix them. Right. And when right. you're charging what I consider to be outlandish numbers, you're just put. you're just making their, their you're, you're hurting them. You're right. torturing them. Right. Thousand cuts. So I don't do that. I mean, that's, that's, that's my, that's my take on fees. I think it's just nuts.
And, and is there is there a range of cases you prefer? Like you won't do certain cases, right? You'll do patent cases, you'll do copyright cases, trademark cases, trade secret cases. Uh, I'm, time out, time out, time out. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm very, very reluctant to get involved in trademark. Because oh, right? Yeah, most trademark stuff doesn't go anywhere. There's not enough, there's not enough, you know, there's not enough work to do. I mean, it's not enough, you know, they don't, no one, they don't really fight to the death in a trademark case. Mm. Patent cases, they fight to the death because there's big money. Mm. Copyright cases that are worth taking are very few and far between. Mm. Uh, uh, but when you get a good copyright case, it's a good case, mm -hmm. you know, and there's more of those than there are trademark cases, in my opinion. Trade secret cases, oftentimes you're up in state court and it's a whole different culture and it's a whole lot different thing. And, and it costs way too much money and it's all he said and she said so it's 50 you know 50 depositions and it's going through everybody's emails i mean i had one that was just in fact what we did we both sides agreed we had uh you know remember danny uh furnace at uh, townsend yeah Danny and my father sat next to each other when they were engineers and i've known um, danny since grade school and we had a case and we had warehouses of um What's the little things you plug into the, you know, the U USB, USB drives. Yeah. We had warehouses in, and we just decided that we both agreed we weren't going to do it. <laughs> it was going to be, it was going to take forever. It was going to cost a shitload of money and we were just going to live with what we could do. So that's what happens in trade secret cases. But I was going to go broader for a second, which is you'll do a business contract dispute. You'll do other stuff right oh exactly. i look at i did a, i did a um statutory rape case mm, wow. for one of, my, one of my baseball players i mean i'll do I'll, generally speaking there, there are two things they have to have it's either got to be interesting mm. those are three things I, i've got to feel i can do it okay so look at uh, this is you know esoteric stuff and i don't it's going to cost way too much for me to to learn this you don't really want to do it and then if they want me to do it anyway, I say, okay, well, the, I just upped the fee 150% because you're being stupid. <laughs> <laughs> in advance, by the way, you got to pay in advance. Because <laughs> 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 you might actually get some smarts from me during the process. Yeah. So then, this, you know, the first thing is it's got a few something I think I can do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing, sort of the criteria is, is it's got to be I, I I call it litigatable. Okay. It's got to have a it's got to have a story that that you can understand. Okay. Uh, like let's like we come into the DNA. Right. I would do that. It's it's impossible. I mean, no one understands it. Right. Okay. So you do that. You do it by the hour, and you'd have a long talk ahead of time saying, "Look, this is going to be a, a real difficult problem," and that's how it is. And then third, it's got to be kind of have kind of got to like it. Yeah. Uh, which is why I don't do a lot of defense. You know, the, the jobs is quote is we steal it when we can. I think that's the basically primary ethic of the Silicon Valley. Right. Like everybody's stealing all the time. And um, because they know that people, you know, that people can get away with it. And I'm not really big on uh, representing people to help them steal from somebody else. Right. That doesn't appeal to me very much. So that's why I end up on the plan side a lot more. Most defendants are guilty. <laughs> so your preference, your preference is plaintiff's case, good patents, deep, deep infringement from well-heeled big corporations. Am I repeating it correctly? That's the ideal case for you? Pretty much? Yeah, something, something. I like cases like between the 80 and $150 million range. Yeah. Um, because you get a $600, 000, $600 million case or a billion dollar case, you're going to do it for 10 years. Right. I mean, it's going to go forever. Right. So you get a little bit smaller and you can get things done. Yeah. You can't go, you can't go a $20 million case because you doesn't right. justify itself. So, so do you see yourself working for another 10, 15 years? Because no. you've been at this now for over 40. It, it's interesting. I I'm sort of thinking that I get one more, what I would call good case. And that might be the end of it. But you know, I closed down once about 10 years ago, and I really didn't like not having anybody to go in the morning. And mm. so uh, I really like having a secretary to do all my baloney for me. 
<laughs> and she's been with you for a long time, right? Oh yeah, yeah. She's been almost the whole time. Gosh. And uh, she leverages me on occasion, so I don't know what'll happen. Well, uh, well, the other thing people don't know about you is you used to be a big time surfer, right? Well, I don't know. I, I used to surf a lot. Yeah, you, you probably still are, right? Oh, can't no? do it. No, no. more. Body, the body, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. <laughs> When's the last time you went surfing? Seven years ago. I quit surfing when I was 65. And, and you went surfing like in the cold water of Baker Beach or right there in San Francisco? Yeah, uh, Ocean Beach. San Ocean Francisco. Beach, right? Yeah. And, and occasionally you would come out to my neck of the woods in Stinson Beach, right? No, or never surfed Stinson. You never surfed? Surf is ain't good there. Well, how about Bellinas? There's a lot of surfers in Bellinas. Uh, it's all little mushy stuff. I mean, huh? you can come down. You, you know, one of these days when you come back out from Florida, we'll go on Ocean Beach on a good day. Yeah. And you'll see the difference. It's it's sure. it's a real different world. It's a very physical experience. You, you you liked it, though, right? Didn't you like it? Yeah. I lived. I used to live out by the beach for that purpose. Right. But and your daughter, your daughter surfs occasionally with you or you see right? she did surf occasionally um but she got busy doing other stuff a lot she um you know she played basketball in college okay. so she got involved in playing basketball a lot and so she's she, in medical school now or she graduated she's graduated she's in a fellowship at university of michigan wow nice. needle so surgery you're going to visit ann arbor every once in a while yeah well very once in a while <laughs> I went to school. I went to school there for a year. I thought it was Not a great turn. It was great. It was great. Well, I mean, she's it's okay. I mean, she you know she's spoiled because she grew up in San Francisco, but uh, it's 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 doable. I went back there and I went. To, we went to a, a football game. You know, that's what you do if you go to the Of course, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so is she going to get married? The last time we talked, you, you didn't. You you talked about. Um, <laughs> I won't even say. Well, what you said. She, she um she's there's no marriage plan presently being presented there's no man worthy of her that's probably true but um there's certainly you know she's had a series i've met a series of boyfriends and she's getting closer you know <laughs> to something that i think makes sense so you and your wife are waiting for the grandkids who can take over the law firm that, that's gotta happen no, right? that's not happening no <laughs> <laughs> well, well, because because you've had a family firm for many decades now, right? Yeah. If you think about it. It's my daughter's fault. She went to medicine said law. I, I know. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking she comes from a family of lawyers, right? Because your wife's father was a federal judge. I remember him. Didn't he sit in St. Central District in Los yeah. Angeles? Because yeah. I remember being in the courthouse in the Central District because I was trained initially in a Beverly Hills firm and we had cases in that court and he was there. Wasn't he like the chief judge there for a while? Oh yeah. I don't think, I don't know if he was ever chief. Cause that's just a, that's a, a timing issue. Right. Had to be chief okay. that. But he, you know, his, his claim, his claims of fame was he was an intimate of Reagan. Right. And when Reagan used to have his kitchen cabinet go to Chasen's uh, restaurant. He was one of those guys. Right. Right. And, uh, yeah. And, and how long also, did he live? Uh, I'm just curious. I'm I'm just curious. How long did he live? He lived to a pretty ripe age, didn't he? Well, 101. Yeah, I thought so. I thought in the back of my mind, I thought he lived a pretty ripe ripe age. It was pretty. It was pretty tough at the end, though. That's an interesting story because you, when your daughter said, "I'm going to go into medicine," did you try to persuade her. No, you got to do law. Well, uh, no, actually, it was pretty. She's dyslexic. Oh, okay. And and she it's hard for her to read. Okay. I mean, she, she can read. I mean, it's not like she can't read. Right. It's more effort. Right. So um, she never really warmed up to the idea of going to law. Okay. Interesting. And also, she wanted to cut things. You know, I can't tell. What can I tell you? Oh, is she a surgeon? Is she yeah. going to be a surgeon? What yeah. kind of surgery? Uh, she's going to apply for a pediatric surgery residence. She, wow. She doesn't nice. know if she'll get it, but that's what she wants to do. Nice. Nice. And yeah, it's sort of funny. When she was in grade school, she wanted to be a. Uh, veterinarian and then right around high school she said it's too sad to cut up animals i'd rather cut up people <laughs> <laughs> that's good and, and and your wife was supportive of her going to medical school yeah she was supportive of whatever she wanted to do if she wanted to go and you know be a hippie in in hawaii she would have supported that too so that's good it's yeah. huge
In the meantime, we've run the course of the of the podcast. We're out of time. We're out of time. Excellent. That's okay because we can do it. We can do it again once you file whatever case you're going to file that hits the newspaper, and I'm worthy to hear about it, and the rest of the audience is worthy to hear about it because. Ed, you've been around for over 45 years in San Francisco, maybe longer than that, right? In total. And your firm's been around for over 40 years. So congratulations, because a lot of lawyers don't make it that long. They quit, they get drunk, they they do stupid things, they lose their health. You've done it. Some of that applies to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I can say certifiably to anyone, Ed will make you laugh. <laughs> while you're paying him big money. We will have some fun. There's no doubt. I, I, in fact, I do. That's part of my, that's part of my gig. I say, look, at, you're going to get good work. I think we're going to win this thing and we're going to have some fun. And what I will say to the end of court, let Ed do the annual musical with some stand-up comedy because he will put that end of court on the map. The yeah, Silicon Valley end of court. I don't think we'll do that, but that's okay. Hey, Ed, thanks for spending the time with me. I'll talk to you again. Take care, okay? Yeah, thank you. Adios. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Tune in next time on The Valley Current. 